Welcome to the Carolina Cast Podcast Season 2, Episode 5. We come to you on a Wednesday night, just two days after the disappointing performance by the Panthers, but we'll get into that in just a moment. I'm Krish Verma alongside Kalen Patel. Welcome back to Episode 5, everybody. Kalen, how are you doing tonight? I'm great, like always. Really, good. It's been a really good week so far. Disappointment on Monday, but otherwise it's been it's been great. Yeah, it was a great week of NFL football. We'll get to that in just a second. But before we do, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button. We are on the road to 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. We just reached 1,050 subscribers yesterday, so thank you all so much. If you want to go check us out on Instagram or TikTok, we are at Carolina Cast Sports, all undercase. And for Twitter slash X, we are Carolina Cast underscore 15 with the two capital C's together. All righty. Let's go ahead and get straight into this. First off, we'll talk about this Carolina Panthers game because, man, Samuel and I were on the call for it, and it was just, it was really rough to watch. And as a Panthers fan, I mean, I've got all my Panthers gear on. So watching that game and calling it, it was really hard to watch. The offense did not get anywhere on Monday night. And it's hard for me to say this, Kalen, the Panthers – Like I've said, I've defended them over the summer for having one of the best defenses and the most underrated defense in the NFL. And I think that was proven on Monday night. They completely locked down the New Orleans Saints. And yes, the slant monster, Michael Thomas, got his receptions. Chris Olave made some crazy catches. But listen, we don't have J.C. Horn at cornerback. We have Dante Jackson, who did well on his coverage. And C.J. Henderson, of course, was abysmal on his coverage. We have J.C. Horn in the game. I don't know if the Saints score a touchdown or not on Monday. So I will say I give a lot of credit to the Panthers defense for holding it down. The offense was just abysmal. I was really disappointed. Bryce Young went 22 for 33, 153 passing yards and a passing touchdown. So another game with about 100 passing yards in it and a touchdown. He had two interceptions against Atlanta. He was safe. He was better in the pocket tonight or Monday night. He was better throwing the football He protected it very well, but I don't know. Maybe the protection was too much because there were no shots taken downfield. His longest play of the game was to Jonathan Mingo for about a 15-yard gain, Kalen. So what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, another lackluster performance for Bryce Young and the Panthers offense. Like you said, I mean, Bryce Young, 22 for 33 with 153 yards. He did have that touchdown pass late in the game, but really is is that garbage time? And so – the, uh, the main question I have for the Panthers offense is who's catching the football. Adam Thielen had a decent game, seven receptions, 54 yards. And then Chubba Hubbard, the backup running back, was the second was the second best leader in catches. So five receptions, 34 yards. And then Mingo had three. Hurst had three. Chark only had one reception. It was a 15-yarder. It was a good game, but... I really thought G.J. Chark would be a big part of this offense. He has been, he has had a slow start, but this was his first game, right? Correct. He was injured for week one. Yeah, just just overall, the Panthers' offense, they have been they haven't been running the football great. They haven't been passing the football great. It's just been terrible. And I, I think the only issue I have on the Panthers defensively is their run commits because Taysom Hill, I mean, we know Taysom Hill being that quarterback, he can – Played literally every position on the football field. Sean Payton started it. Dennis Allen continues it at the helm with New Orleans. Taysom Hill had nine carries for 75 yards. Taysom Hill, almost every time he went in as quarterback and did a QB draw, he picked up the first down nearly every single time. It was honestly incredible to watch. I was really disappointed. But then passing-wise, Carolina did great. Derek Carr's stat line, 21 for 36, 228 passing yards and an interception from Von Bell. Yeah, Panthers, the Panthers defense, we, I mean, you said it before, we thought this Panthers defense was going to be good, and they really showed up today, or Monday, against the Saints, only allowing 20 points, which may seem like a lot, but really it isn't, considering they have some high-powered offenses scoring, like, twice that, for example, Cowboys 40-0. But, um... 
But the thing is, for the Panthers, once they have J.C. Horn back, they are going to be locking down the Saints. Like you said, they would not have scored a touchdown if J.C. Horn was in that football game. I think, uh, wait, when is J.C. Horn coming back? Uh, J.C. Horn is expected to be back in a few weeks, but I don't think that's just the end of this for the injury-wise for the Panthers because we'll get to Bryce Young's um, questionable he was limited. He was actually ruled out for practice today. But another big key about the Panthers' defense is Shaq Thompson on Monday night. If you were watching, he got hit at the end of one of the plays. Uh, Deshaun Williams and an offensive line were having an altercation. Ran into Shaq Thompson, and his ankle just bended backwards. He had to get. He was carted off the field, and he officially yesterday had surgery and was ruled out for the rest of the season. So Shaq Thompson is definitely in his elderly ages in the NFL. He's a Panther for life. He's been here even during the Cam Newton era. So losing Shaq Thompson is going to be really tough because he's definitely one of the biggest leaders on this Panthers defense. And that means Brian Burns just got to be playing an even bigger role with, without having the contract that I think he deserves. Which, Kalen, brings me to my next point about this is... So I think I can see what Carolina's trying to do. I see the issues they're having with Bryce Young's, uh, excuse me, Brian Burns' contract. Because with Brian Burns, they don't want to give him that $28 million per year because the Panthers are projected to be top 10 in cap space for next season. And they want to spend that on free agency and try and get Bryce Young some weapons because they did it this year. They completely reloaded the offense. They got Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, Hayden Hurst, Miles Sanders, that was all free agency. But next season, you got an opportunity to go sign a wide receiver like T. Higgins, who has some type of closeness to Charlotte, and he played for Clemson, and there could be some mutual interest because T. Higgins would become wide receiver one for the Panthers. And yes, it is very obvious, more than half the NFL teams could use T. Higgins as a wide receiver one. That's the talent he has, and he's not a wide receiver one because he plays on the Bengals. And they have Jamar Chase. But T. Higgins would be a nice signing. And there's going to be other guys the Panthers can go after. But they're going to need salary cap for it. And the Panthers don't have a lot of draft picks. So it's not like they can make up for that talent in the draft. So is it worth spending all of it on Brian Burns? And missing out on a talent like T. Higgins. And help at the offensive line position in free agency. And then lacking picks in the NFL draft next season. Or do you pay Brian Burns and see what you can get in free agency? Well, first of all, if I'm Brian Burns, I'm looking at how defensive players are getting paid recently. Nick Bosa had that massive contract. So if I'm Brian Burns, I think I think Brian Burns is on just slightly like one tier lower than a guy like Nick Bosa. So he's I think he should get like well, if I'm Brian Burns, I'm thinking I should get at least like three-fourths of what Nick Bosa is. I want a lengthy, big contract. And if I'm the Panthers, I'm like, well, we want to build a successful winning team. We don't want to spend all our money on one player to have that one player play good football, but the rest of the defense be lackluster, the rest of the offense be lackluster. So really, it's just not a good football team. So if I'm Brian Burns, I have to realize that if I want to win football games, I have to negotiate and be a little bit more lenient towards the Panthers because he needs he needs a team team friendly contract in order for the Panthers team to be successful in five years in the future. And what I think the best solution is is well the example I want to talk about is Tom Brady. He never got a big contract because he wanted to win Super Bowls. And he won Super Bowls because he had his team use his money on other weapons to win Super Bowls. So I think that Brian Birds needs to think a little bit more like Tom Brady and be like, I can't take all of my team's money if we want to win football games. That's that's what's really going on here. Yeah, and I don't think it's just that, but I mean, if I'm Brian Burns as well, on another standpoint, like I've played to the point where I deserve to make my money, correct? And I definitely be- I do think that Brian Burns should get a good contract. And I know he deserves it. He's played great football for Carolina his entire tenure here. I mean, his rookie season was incredible. I went to a Panthers game that year, which Brian Burns had a scoop and score fumble in that game. I mean, he was explosive on defense that game. Not just that game. We've seen it in every single game that he's taken a snap in. He is a scary freak athlete, and he has proven the money he deserves. But the problem is, Kalen, which I do agree with what you're saying, is a lot of these guys are going are playing in the NFL for the money. 
Now, I'm not saying Brian Burns is just playing for the NFL and the money because we don't know. We know that the Panthers and Brian Burns on the contract issues are not close, but we don't know what that estimate is. So that's what we're still waiting to find out. Like, are the pan? Are is, does Brian Burns really want twenty eight to thirty million dollars a year, or is it something lower that even the Panthers are not willing to give? Or are there other signing bonus issues? We don't know that. There hasn't been enough information given out to the public. All we've known is there's been random days where we think like, okay, there is a possibility the signing can happen tonight. Two weeks from now, we still are at the same spot. And now I, the good thing is Brian Burns is playing through all this, which I really. I'm grateful for that shows the type of athlete he is. He he's not just going to sit out to get his contract. He's going to go prove himself to make more, which I think is another issue the Panthers made. If Brian Burns is or he's already off to a great start, correct? If yeah. Brian Burns continues to play this well, his price is only going to get higher. So Carolina already missed their opportunity to sign him because if Brian Burns breaks out even more, and becomes like TJ Watt, Nick Bosa tier, his price is going to be even higher than what you could have gotten him for right now. Yeah, so that just emphasizes that the Panthers need to act quickly. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff we have to act quickly on, especially because Bryce Young's performance on Monday night. And now I know we are two games in, and I've seen so many people overreacting, calling this things like the worst trade in NFL history. Guys, Trey Lance was one of the worst trades in NFL history. I don't think Bryce Young could compare to that yet because Bryce Young is actually, I think, at this point, in a few games by now, Bryce Young would have played more NFL games than Trey Lance did. So um, we're not, we're going to take that off the table. But I do want to ask you this. Caitlin, this has been a very slow, sluggish start for Bryce Young. And I know there are rookies that are definitely outperforming him right now. I know Anthony Richardson's playing great. I know C.J. Stroud, despite the Texans' defense being awful and it looks like they're getting blown out, C.J. Stroud was amazing against the Colts. I Like, incredible. I was watching that game. He knows he runs around the pocket. I know everyone's talking about, oh, we can't read a defense because he failed this football test. Like, he can play football. He has the skill set to do it. And it's not like Bryce Young doesn't. Bryce Young just has not made that connection that C.J. Stroud has with his guys. And another thing is, the Texans kept some of their coaches and that coaching staff. The Panthers have not only rebuilt an entire new offense around Bryce Young as talent-wise and player-wise, it's a brand new coaching staff that the Panthers never had until this season. So all of that is trying to come together in one year. And I guess that's that's what my thing is. That's why I'm not that concerned about Bryce Young from the start. It also looks a little biased. I will say that. You caught me red-handed. But I got to ask you, Caitlin, because you're coming from a somewhat neutral standpoint on this. How concerned are you about Bryce Young? Well, honestly, when I look at the first two weeks of the season, Anthony Richardson has just been beyond. CJ Stroud, like you said, he's been playing great. And Bryce Young's just not been doing it. And it's not like, and he's getting his reps. The Panthers are having him throw the ball 30, 40 times a game. And he's just, he's only completed about 20, 25 passes a game he is just not I feel like the expectations were too high that's what I think I think the expectations were way too high um uh, obviously his first overall pick it's not like they're gonna treat him like he was I don't know a fourth rounder but he he's still so young he's played two games mm-hmm. now five weeks in the season six weeks in the season if he's still playing like this then I might have to say oh this is turning out to be a worse trade for the Panthers but then it, but like you're saying it's a completely new unit the coaches are different the offense is different they've got so many free agents you were talking about Adam Thielen DJ Chark Hayden Hurst Miles Sanders they're all new on the offensive side so it makes sense for this offense to not be playing to the best of their ability for these first five six weeks of the season yeah, and it's definitely going to take some time to adjust because, as you can already see, I'm, Bryce Young, we he has one comfortable target, I feel like. Against Atlanta, it was Hayden Hurst. Against New Orleans, it was Adam Thielen, which Adam Thielen had a, I would say, great, I would say that's a great game. Seven receptions, 54 yards, and a touchdown, I think is a great game. But then just everything else was lacking on the other side of the football. I mean, Jonathan Mingo had eight targets and only made or caught three of those. And DJ Chark only had that one target. He was fairly quiet. 
which I'm not going to say that was a bad free agency signing. We only signed DJ Chark to a one-year, $5 million contract, which is for a guy like DJ Chark, who you, you hear DJ Chark, that's not really as big as a household name, but you, you, can, you can probably know who DJ Chark is. And that's, that's a pretty good contract. That's a team-friendly contract. One year, $5 million for DJ Chark. Obviously, you'd like to see more out of him, which, yes, like we're saying, it is his first game. He's coming back from an injury. Maybe that was why he was lacking so much. Then Hayden Hurst had a solid game. I don't know. It's also it's also the offensive line. I don't know how we're leaving this out. It's also the offensive line. As much as we want to make excuses as Panthers fans, one that it might sound like an excuse, but is actually real is our offensive line. We are missing Austin Corbett, one of our best offensive linemen, who tore his ACL last year. He's still out. Brady Christian just had a biceps injury in week one. He's out for the rest of the season. So that means Chandler Zavala, who the Panthers drafted in the fourth round, is stepping in. And then Justin McCray, who the Panthers signed in free agency this year, who was a former Falcon, is stepping in. So it's just you're, you're progressively going downhill at the offensive line position. And then I hate to pick on this, but then you're then Bryce Young is almost as tall as me. Then so you're putting that against a bad offensive line and talent not able to get open. What else do you expect? Yeah, exactly. The thing is with Bryce Young, he's obviously uh, I I believe he's like just a little bit shorter than six foot, and. That's already a disadvantage if you're an NFL quarterback. I mean, that's why come when it was April, people were saying, oh, they're going to pick C.J. Stroud, AR-15 over Bryce Young because Bryce Young is too short. Well, that is true. He is sh- – I think he's the shortest quarterback in NFL history. Is that correct? Uh, He might be. He's at five – he was listed at 5.10 at the combine. I'll have to check. All right, so he's listed at 5.10 at the combine. Anyway, Chris, why you fact check that? And then behind a broken offensive line, it's just not a good combination. Bryce Young needs to have a good, effective offensive line for him to be able to operate like he did under Nick Saban in Alabama because Alabama had one of the best offensive lines in all of college football, if not the best. So that is why Bryce Young is, cannot operate under a broken offensive line. That's just how it's probably going to be for a very long time. Yes, I'm trying to look this up. It was Kyler Murray at five foot ten. So Bryce Young also five foot ten. So now I'm looking at inches right now to try to get this down a little bit. So he was he was at six foot at Alabama and then went down to five ten. So it looks like Bryce Young might be just a hair taller than Kyler Murray. But either way, at the six, he is a short. He is short for a quarterback, and that is definitely something. And you're not going to draft a short quarterback with the first overall pick unless he is that guy. And Bryce Young proved in college at Alabama that he was that guy. And obviously, the the change from college to the NFL is difficult. Some guys blend into the NFL style more than the than um, some others do. There's some of the rookies. So I think maybe it just takes more time for Bryce Young to develop. Also, another thing that we come up with as we'll move on to our next thing is Bryce Young sat out of practice today with an ankle injury and is currently questionable for Week 3's game on the road against Seattle as the Panthers are looking at Andy Dalton to potentially, I mean, obviously we have to see what happens tomorrow if Bryce Young does practice or not, to potentially start Week 3 against Seattle and the Panthers sign Jake Luton back to their practice squad just in case of any issues. So... Kayla, not to ask you on this, so now already we don't know the exact play. Even Frank Wright came out in a press conference today. We do not know the exact play that this injury might have occurred, but Bryce Young already has somewhat of an injury just two weeks into the NFL season, and he's already struggling. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, here's the thing. Bank of America Stadium, it's a turf field. And you know what happens on turf fields? Lots of injuries. I mean, Aaron Rodgers, Achilles Stair, turf field, and MetLife Stadium – Turf fields and I have an issue. I cannot deal with turf fields. As a Cowboys fan, looking at that turf field, it just annoys me. That shade of green does not exist in nature when I when I look at AT&T Stadium. Just turf fields in general, they are not good for football. And if all the NFL 
literally the NFL said they were going to replace all the fields that are going to be the World Cup with grass. So they're going to do it for soccer, but they're not going to do it for the player safety in the NFL. I just, this issue just, it just makes me so mad that turf is still in national, in the National Football League. It just doesn't belong there. It is risking the player's safety when they play on that turf field. That's just, I just hate turf field. That's really all I have to say about that. I mean, I completely agree. The Panthers have played, excuse me, on um, normal natural grass for like ever. And then all of a sudden, Charlotte FC, the soccer, the soccer club comes into town. They play on turf. So the Panthers are now like, oh, well, if Charlotte FC is going to play on turf, then why don't we just let the Panthers play on turf? So there is kind of like a lazy thing now that they're just getting rid of this grass to kind of let the Panthers play on turf, which I obviously, like you're saying, I'm not a fan of it. I like the Like literally, you see the background right here. This picture was taken a few years ago. That is... That is what the Panthers stadium looked like a few years ago. Normal, natural grass. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what I miss. But um, unfortunately, we just have to try and get by it. I, it's not completely why Shaq Thompson's injury happened, but I can, I'm can, i almost certain that's why Bryce Young has this ankle injury. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... I, I just don't... It's just such a terrible thing that the NFL is doing to their players by consistently having turf fields. And... The thing is, a lot of these owners like the turf fields because it's less expensive. They don't have to pay someone um, to mow the lawn every single day to like make sure the grass is perfect because the natural grass is going to grow. So that's that's also another big part of it. Natural grass is also uh, much more expensive. And for stadiums that have domes like SoFi Stadium, how is the how are they going to walk? Yeah. There's no rain that can get into to the natural grass, so they have to pay another finance for people with the water to make sure the grass grows fine. So it's it's just it's a lot of expensive, but it's the right thing to do for your player safety. Yes, yeah, certainly, and I think there can be an exception if the if the NFL was to make a rule that all stadiums must have grass. I think mean, there's an exception for like coliseums or like closed in stadiums that they can have turf just because you know you can, you're not really able to get natural grass inside but mm -hmm. certainly for a player safety standpoint th it, this is needed this is certainly needed so we'll go to our final topic about the panthers before we move on to some nfl and college football so the panthers lost their first game on the road to the falcons lose monday night football to the saints those are two division games in your first two games of the season and you lose both, everyone else in the NFC South is 2-0. and So now I have to ask you this. After these first two games, is the Panthers' playoff chances already over? I mean, you can't really say that over uh... – over the first two games. This is what a this is what um a good friend of mine told me. I really agree with this though. Good uh okay. Good football fans make observations. Bad football fans come to conclusions after just two weeks of the NFL mm -hmm. season. Correct. That's 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 what I really use to base off questions like this because it's been two weeks. Correct. It has been two mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. So the Buccaneers are 2-0, the Saints are 2-0, the Falcons are 2-0. The Falcons, Saints, and Buccaneers have not played real competition mm -hmm. yet. So we don't know if any of those teams are really 2-0 quality teams. So really, mm -hmm. I think this division could come down to the wire like it did last year. I mean, yeah, the, the Panthers almost won the division. They finished with a 7-10 record. The, the Buccaneers made the playoffs with an eight and nine record just for people who forget under 500 made the playoffs and the Panthers almost beat them out for it and went seven and 10 and made the playoffs. And that's because ironically, the Panthers lost all of their games that year, the last season, but they won they won all of their games against division rivals or in division teams. They were, they swept the Falcons I believe, yeah, they, we swept the Fal No, we lost. We split with the Falcons, swept the Saints, and almost swept the Buccaneers. So we were getting our wins from division games. Yeah. So 
the Panthers, they've been good in divisional games so far. This week, they've had a slow – this year, they've had a slow start. They've got a new quarterback and a completely new system. I'm sure when the late divisional games come, week 13, 14, 15, they're going to be back at it. And hopefully, their offense will be running smoothly under the Bryce Young-Frank Reich duo. Yeah, as I guess the good thing for Carolina is they don't have to really worry – about playing these teams for a while, like you just mentioned. I think the next game against a division team is the Buccaneers in week 13. So the Panthers, for now, are just going to have to take care of business. Like obviously, next week against Seattle, then you march on to uh, back home for Minnesota, Detroit. Miami is going to be very tough. That's a test. By week, and then, of course, Hall of Honor game against Texans and beyond. But... I, the, the schedule is, at least for how the team's playing so far, the Panthers, the schedule looks pretty hard, at least for how the team's playing. If the team was playing better than this, then I would say this is a cakewalk schedule. I think the Panthers would be above 500 going into the bye week. And also, my prediction was the Panthers going into bye week to be 2-4 and four and turn it around in the second half of their season just because of how easy this, uh, the schedule is in the second half. Which, because they get the Texans, they get the Colts, they get the Bears, the Cowboys is obviously tough. They get the Titans, Buccaneers, Falcons, Packers, Jaguars, and Buccaneers again. Like, the second half of the season is a lot easier. Yeah, if the Panthers were way to the best of the ability, they would lose two of those games, Cowboys and Jaguars. Yeah, and I, I, I think they can beat the Packers. I don't know how good Jordan Love really is for Green Bay. I know if Will's watching this, I'm sorry. I, I don't know how good the Packers really are. They look great against the Chicago Bears, who are rumored to be the worst team in the NFL again. And then he also was a victim to the Atlanta Falcons. So it makes me feel better that, you know, it wasn't just us who lost to Atlanta, at least to prove to the world that the Panthers aren't that bad. Yeah, I think, okay, right now, at, at a completely neutral point, because I am not a Panther fan. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So a completely neutral point, I think that the Panthers are the 27th best team in the NFL. I think they're, I think they're a top five bottom team right now, but I really think they could turn it around. And I think their their ceiling right now is to be number 15 or 14. Yeah, I think that's pretty solid. See, the only thing that's hard about this situation is I would be completely fine with all of this. If we had a first round pick and we don't have a first round pick. And that's why I need this team to perform better now because we don't have a first round pick for the 2024 NFL draft. And that means that we are not going to be set up for any type of new talent, really good talent for next year's draft. If we had a first round pick, Kalen, we could have gone out and drafted Marvin Harrison and get Bryce Young an insane weapon from college. But we can't do that because we traded it away for Bryce Young. And I'm not going to sit here and complain about it, but all I'm going to say is the fact that we're not going to be able to add talent from the draft. Like I was talking about the Brian Burns situation. We're not going to be able to add talent from the draft because we traded for Bryce Young, which means everything has to be free agency. Here's the thing. A lot, you said at the beginning of this episode, a lot of people have said this Bryce Young trade has been one of the worst in NFL history. I don't think it's the worst, but if this trade makes the Chicago Bears have DJ Moore and Caleb Williams next season, or even Justin Fields, DJ Moore, and Marvin Harrison Jr. next season, then this could be a top five worst trade in NFL history. So I think what the Panthers have to do is not make that happen, win football games, and give the Chicago and give the Chicago Bears a 13th or 14th overall pick. I mean, yes, certainly. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. Like th this is not a good spot to be in. But at the same time, I do have to say, like it's not the DJ Moore is doing all he can for the Bears, but it's not like they're progressing either. So both of those teams are trying to get better in general. So that's why they made this trade together. But I don't. It's it's a very interesting situation with both teams because you look at the Panthers roster, and, and it's not like okay, it's not the best in the world, but I mean, still looks, there's some quality gems around this team. They should be solid. And then you just look at how they performed. You honestly, I'm honestly shocked that this is how we started the season.
like I knew there was a possibility for us to start the year 0 and 2 and to lose games, but I didn't think we'd lose them like this. Well, to be fair, this Monday night football game, the scoreboard it the scoreboard was 20 to 17, okay? It was a 3-point loss. It wasn't a what was it? 14 point loss like we had to Atlanta. It was a three yep. point loss. So we are getting better. We are getting better because New Orleans is better than Atlanta right now. So we lost by three to New Orleans and we lost by 14 to Atlanta. So it's improvement. It's slow, but it's improved. So if you're a Panthers fan right now, I know there's a lot of you, do not be turning off your TVs, canceling your Sunday ticket subscriptions, and just not watching Panthers football anymore because you need to watch because this team has potential. It really does. And it, it might come slow, but if it takes us to glory, I'm I'm waiting for it. And I know all us Panthers fans have been waiting since 1995, so we're we're all for it. I, I mean, I'm a fan for life. It says it back there, so I'm I'm here for it. I'm ready for this long journey, and I'm I'm obviously I wanted to come soon because we've been waiting so long. We've hyped up this team a lot. But if it, if it takes time, I'm I'm okay with that by all means. But let's go ahead and move on to college football. We spent about 30 minutes talking about the Panthers. That's pretty good. But we'll talk about some college football for a little bit and wrap this up. So college football week four starting this week. Not a lot of movement happening with the rankings really, Kalen, other than Texas and Florida State swapping with each other. So the Longhorns become third in the country and Florida State drops to four after their close call to Boston College. And then the Carolina Cast broadcast on Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, Florida State, number four team in the country, will go on the road to play Clemson. That will be our broadcast for this Saturday. That'll be right after we have College Game Day Week 4 edition. So we'll talk about this Florida State game here. Kalen, So Clemson obviously had that struggle against Duke back in week one. They looked awful in that game. Blue Devils just shut them down. So how do you think Clemson prepares to take on Florida State as one of the best offenses in college football? I mean, Clemson has a home field advantage in this football game. They've got to get they've got to get the energy back up in Clemson, North Carolina. They have to get everybody on their feet. They have to be ready. For this football game, they're hosting the fourth best team in the country. They're playing a college football playoff level team. They have to go out. They have to compete in front of their home fans, and they have to keep the game close. They cannot lose early. They cannot be down 13-0, 14-0 by the end of the first quarter. They need to be in the game through four quarters, at least three quarters, and that fourth quarter make that jump if they want any chance at winning this football game. Personally, don't really think it's going to happen. Yeah, and I, I can I can agree with that. I don't really think it happens. I think Florida State is obviously the better team being ranked fourth and proving how good their offense really is, how strong their offense is. I mean, wide receiver position looks really good with Johnny Wilson running the show at a six foot seven frame. I mean, dude, Johnny Wilson for Florida State is absolutely beast. He is huge. And the and there's there are obviously a lot of players around the team, Trey Benson and Lawrence Toafili at running back. And then just just great receivers in general for Jordan Travis to the football too. And then for Clemson, obviously, we know that Kate Klubnick is trying to find his rhythm. He's definitely found it playing some weaker opponents. And now you got to just step front and get ready to play a good team. Yeah, that's it exactly. And so we look at some of the other games for Carolina games on Friday. NC State plays Virginia at 7.30. I think the Wolfpack do take this game. Mm -hmm. Brandon Armstrong gets it done on the road against the Cavaliers. But, Kalen, I got to ask you because I I think I have my upset alert, and I know it's going to be super annoying to the media. Like, oh, my gosh, of course. Do you have any sort of upset alerts for week four? Or what do you think is the more and en- most enticing game to watch on Saturday? All right. Well, first of all, I think we might have the same biggest in- upset right now. But uh, I'll get to that. In- well, not biggest necessarily, but our most likely upset. Um, what upsets I think could happen really are Ole Miss upsetting Alabama. They've been down recently. The Alabama football team, they, they barely beat UC. Well, they didn't barely beat them, but their quarterback situation in Alabama, it is terrible. Jalen Milroy, they had three different quarterbacks play that football game. And it was just 
awful offensively. I think in total, they maybe had 200 passing yards. They maybe had 200 passing yards. So, against the University of Central Florida, against a team that is not in a power... I don't think they're in a Power 5 conference. They're, they're, power, they're in the American Power... That's six with ECU. Oh, so they're in, EC, they're in ECU's conference, but still... They cannot be beating Alabama in a football game. They cannot be keeping it this close. Alabama should have won that game 60 to nothing. They should have won that game 60 to nothing. And that's probably one of my closer upsets. Ole Miss over Alabama. And then let's just get to the big one over here. I think that Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, is going to come out in Oregon and beat the Ducks. I knew it. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, I, I know it sounds super annoying to the media, and I will tell you this. Or Colorado might not win this football game. This is going to be a good football game. I do not see any type of blow. I don't see a blowout from Oregon. I don't see a blowout from Colorado. Bo Nix versus Shadur Sanders on ABC is going to be incredible to watch. I mean, big game, televised. Bo Nix is a great quarterback, started with Auburn. He's been incredible for the Ducks, definitely raising his draft stock. Obviously, not as high as guys like Caleb Williams and Drake May. But, I mean, Bo Nix has been an incredible college quarterback for the Ducks ever since transferring. And then Shadur Sanders has been incredible for Colorado. Obviously, I think the only issue for the Buffaloes going into this game is Travis Hunter is going to be out for a few weeks as he took that big hit against Colorado State. You know, the game that almost everyone was watching at 2 a.m., on last Saturday, that, that was definitely me. I'm one of them. My dad and I were watching that game. That was incredible to watch. One of the probably one of the best games of the season, double overtime. But and Travis Hunter took a really big hit in that game. So he, what we've heard is that he's going to be he's going to be out for this game. He's going to be out for a few games. Try and get him rest up for coming down to the final few games of the regular season. And hopefully, Colorado's looking at maybe even the postseason. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, the Oregon quarterback's really good. But Oregon has been known for developing really, really good college football quarterbacks. Justin Herbert, Marcus Mariota, just to name a few big names. Yeah, certainly. They, they, they know how to produce quarterbacks. Obviously, Marcus Mariota didn't turn out the best in the NFL, but he was great in college for Oregon, won a Heisman. Justin Herbert, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL today, has one of the biggest contracts in the NFL today. So And then, obviously, I don't think Bo Nix is a remake of Mariota or of Herbert, but I think Bo Nix, his college career kind of, is going to um, maybe show what he could do in the NFL. So we're going to move on from college. Not a lot to talk about, really. We'll, we'll recap the games on our next podcast because, obviously, I, I, one of the biggest games, I think coolest games for us, is that Charlotte goes on the road to play at Florida with – Trevor Etienne, the brother of Travis, and that big Florida team pulled off the ups against Tennessee. But we're going to go to our final thing. So if you're watching Monday Night Football, it, was, it wasn't just the Panthers game because in the Panthers game, we saw Shaq Thompson and Jamal Williams for the Saints go down, which means now they have to rely on Tony James Jr. to be the running back in New Orleans because Alvin Kamara is still suspended, and now Jamal Williams is injured. Shaq Thompson out for the rest of the season. But then a gory injury, Nick Chubb is out for the rest of the season. And it's really sad because, yes, I am a victim because I drafted Nick Chubb with my first-round pick in fantasy this year. And actually, ironically, a few years back when Michael Thomas had his the first of his injuries after his, you know, his incredible, um, one of the best seasons from a wide receiver ever. I drafted Michael Thomas in the first round and the injuries begun the second I drafted him. So I, I, I might, I've made some mistakes with it, but obviously prayers go out to Nick Chubb and for a speedy recovery, the Aaron Rodgers injury still hurts. I mean, Kalen, there's so many injuries around the NFL. It's honestly sad. Jalen Waddle was in concussion protocol. I still believe he is in concussion protocol. Anthony Richardson is in concussion protocol. I believe he's ruled out to play on Sunday. I think Gardner Minshew is starting for the Colts. So, I mean, what do you think about all these injuries? I'm, I'm devastated. Yeah, it's really just hard to watch football now without seeing an injury that's going to take a player out for at least like three, four weeks. And 
The biggest issue for me, I said it earlier in the podcast, it's the turf. I hate turf. It is ruining the game of football. We need to get natural grass fields in every single NFL stadium with the exception of SoFi and maybe Allegiant. So that is my big issue. And then also, it's just concussions. NFL needs... In practice, people have these extra padding on their helmets. Then the NFL is not putting them in real games because it just doesn't look good. So what you do is you add extra padding in the interior. Because the thing is, NFL helmets, they've evolved a lot to prevent concussions. But it's still not, they're still not invincible. And I think just, just keep on innovating every single year. Add more padding. Science is telling us that they're, it's capable, they're capable of making helmets that are better for preventing concussions, but the NFL is just not using them. I think this is a bad job by the NFL Players Association. Yes, yeah, certainly we need to see some upgrading from the NFL PA. And we obviously, I think there, there are some type of scandals going on in the off season as well. And like some people trying to get changes for the health of players. And, you know, it's weird because the NFL on commercials and stuff are always talking about, you know, the health of players and how much it means to the game, which obviously they care. They're, they're just, it's taking time for them to apply everything and get it together. But hopefully they do get it done soon because it sucks seeing some of the best NFL players go down. We're two weeks into the NFL season and we're already missing so much talent for the rest of the year. It yeah, is. So I think that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for this podcast. Season two, episode five of the Carolina cast. Thank you all so much for tuning in before we head out though. I want to point out some things on Saturday, Carolina cast goes live for college game day at 10 45 AM. This will be week four edition. We missed week three and our game on week three. We apologize. This had um, nobody was really available for the stuff on that Saturday, but we will be ready for this Saturday. And then at 12 p.m. Eastern time, number four, Florida State goes on the road to play at Clemson. And then Panthers versus Seahawks next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. I will be on the call for that game. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, the Carolina cast on the road to 2,000 subscribers. If you want to follow us on Instagram or TikTok, we are at Carolina cast sports and for Twitter slash X Carolina cast 15. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm Krish Verma alongside Kaylin Patel. We will see you all in our next episode. So we say so long from Bank of America Stadium. Ooh.